Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Richard Ice. I'm the provost here at Thomas and Benedict University. Uh, welcome today. Uh, this is one of the four breakout sessions. This focus is on uh, higher education uh, and uh, liberal arts and higher education being and some of the issues we've been talking about in the media. I'm hoping that this is going to be a much interactive session. I'm going to just have a couple of questions for our panelists. And then I'm going to open it up for all of you to, uh, to ask questions. Usually, our panelists are asking questions. We get to ask them questions. <coughs> so, so kind of turning, turning the tables. This conference has been discussing a lot of the issues that face liberal arts colleges. And we've been looking at economic issues, we've been looking at enrollment issues, we've been looking at demographic issues, we've looked at curricular issues. So lots of issues have been discussed. Now we're going to look at how that's being discussed in the public sphere, uh, particularly uh, in media outlets. We have a distinguished group of panels here today to help us make heads and tails out of what's, what's going on and the reporting of the liberal artists. First, we have uh, Scott Jason, his editor and one of the three founders of Inside Higher Education. He also wants me to tell you he's got some blank He also was uh, editor. Next to Scott is Becky Sipiano, a senior reporter for the Chronicle of Higher Education. And Lori Sterling is, writes uh, for uh, the Minneapolis Star Tribune and he is a member of the Board of Trustees at Coe College. More fuller uh, biographies are, are in your own So, what we'll do is first we're going to start with. Uh, and the first question I have is, from your perspective, or not Becky, <laughs> Lori, sorry, Lori, again, I guess sorry, Lori, uh, from your perspective and what you've been seeing in, in the reporting, what do you see as the key issues facing the uh, Well, thank you, Richard, and it's fun to be with all of you today to drive up from the Twin Cities, and the Minnesotans in the room may want to know that I did not have to travel across the 35W Bridge this morning, which has been shut down by protesters. And all the news back home is part of the reason I was not able to be with you yesterday. It's a busy time, and that's in part because we have a primary election less than a month away in Minnesota. So I'm really glad to be able to be with you here this morning. Uh, and, and what a great thing I think this conference is to uh, begin to do something that I've been thinking for a long time needs to happen, and that is to better distinguish in, in our own minds and in the public's minds what is distinctive, different, desirable about liberal arts education. I, I knew I might be one of the first speakers at this panel, so I went to my grocery store to look for some examples of uh, what kind of publicity liberal arts education might be getting right now, and I didn't have to look very far. Have you seen this cover from the Consumer Reports magazine? Sure. This month, I finally ruined my life by going to college. I quickly grabbed the magazine and began to look, kind of hoping it wasn't the liberal arts college that this example student on the cover had attended, and indeed it is not. It's a, she actually attended three colleges, none of them liberal arts colleges, one a community college, one a state college in Portland, Oregon. Nevertheless, $132,000 in debt after at age 32 and uh, feeling as, as though she's trapped. The, uh, the statistic that uh, uh, was, it, it caught my eye also was uh, uh, in some national survey, 45% of people with student loan debt said that college was not worth the cost. I think that's the kind of publicity we've been seeing a lot of, too much of. I, I noticed that this story uh, appeared in Consumer Reports, a publication that is devoted pretty exclusively to helping Americans maximize their money, not their happiness, and not their relationships, and not the quality of their communities, and, or the quality of their life, and not maybe the critical thinking capacity that I think is desirable among the citizens in the most powerful democracy that the world has ever seen. Uh, that kind of money-focused analysis is probably what the seven million readers of Consumer Reports have come to expect, but I think it's also 
what Americans have come to see and hear from other news sources, and that would include my own. Uh, higher education is described and evaluated these days almost exclusively in terms of cost. Occasionally, but only occasionally, I find in terms of return on investment. The less quantifiable returns, because they are less quantifiable, are often left unmentioned. And certainly little effort is being made to distinguish between liberal arts education and other post-secondary learning programs. Now, as a co-college board member, co-college Cedar Rapids, Iowa, student body of about 1,400, I find these omissions regrettable. But as a journalist at a major metropolitan daily newspaper, I find them understandable. After all, it is what we hear all the time from our sources. And I can tell you about my conversation just yesterday with the congressional candidate in Minnesota's 2nd Congressional District who came to call on us because we are beginning our endorsement screening. When higher education came up, he went into a rant, saying that uh, higher education is a total disaster in this country with skyrocketing costs. He said, we put too many people into four-year liberal arts degrees. It was one his one mention of liberal arts. <laughs> and, and said, my auto mechanic doesn't have to look for work. The people who have anthropology degrees do, he says, and how terrible that is. A, a person with a four-year degree in anthropology and a $100,000 loan, it's not a pretty situation, he said. I asked him, what would you propose the federal government do about that? Well, something. <laughs> <laughs> something might be there is an advisor to Trump who is proposing that federally guaranteed student loans not be made available for liberal arts education because it is seen as not sufficiently contributing to the, the, the workforce of the country. This is dangerous stuff, folks. We are at a bad place and at a place where some kind of better educational offensive, including people, with people of, in my profession, I think are in order. You know, I, I'm not here to defend uh, what, what happens with, with journalism. I'm, I'm a critic of it myself. But I, I, I do find this sort of thing understandable. Uh, Americans, America's news organizations, after all, are a reflection of American society. And I was struck by nine years ago or so when a, <coughs> the U.S. Labor Secretary Robert Reich's book, Super Capitalism, came out. I find the frame he, create, he cast in that book to be still a useful one to understand what's been happening to higher education and to so many things. As technology has changed our economy and, and has made it more possible for us to get great deals, great bargains, as our, our capitalism has gone on steroids almost, uh, some of the other duties of citizenship have become less important. We've become more attuned to the financial bottom line in all of life and maybe more depth to other considerations. Here's a line from uh, Reich's book. And the last several decades have involved a shift of power away from us in our capacities as citizens and toward us as consumers and investors. Consumers and investors have more access to more choices and better deals, but the institutions that have negotiated to spread the wealth and protect what citizens value in common have begun to disappear. Well, that goes one of those institutions I would argue have been historically liberal arts uh, colleges, which were historically created, most of them, to, to build a better society, one graduate at a time. Now, I, I, I'm not here to offer a, a prescription for, for change, but I am clear that, that liberal arts colleges do offer something of great value still, and we need to find ways to better celebrate it and trumpet it and sell it to journalists like me. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can talk together today about the best ways to do that. I have a few ideas, uh, but I'm, I'm hoping that uh, we can make it clear that uh, this kind of problem is not a problem associated with liberal arts education, but active, and in fact, liberal arts colleges are offering a fine value proposition to Americans. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. What do you see as uh, key issues facing liberal arts? Well, hi, everyone, and thanks for having me here, too. Um, so I write a lot about college affordability, so sorry, I'm going to be talking about that, too. Um, there are obviously lots of other problems facing liberal arts colleges and higher education in general, and um, this is just the one I think about the most. So um, obviously, and then Consumer Reports covers a great example of this, there's a lot of uh, challenge in terms of the, the way that the cost of education, the price that students pay, is perceived by the public, right? We know families grossly overestimate how much higher education costs. There's a lot of confusion about how it works. The whole conversation is about um, outliers, where people have had particularly unfortunate situations for whatever reason. 
Um, that's all true. I'm very sensitive to that. I get frustrated by some of the things that I read that seem to me to be kind of missing the point. At the same time, I've been thinking more and more about um, the kinds of things that we heard in a presentation earlier in the conference, right? The affordability problem is a real problem. Um, there aren't enough families who can and want to pay for this kind of education to go around. I don't have to explain that to any of you. I know most of the colleges represented at this conference work pretty hard to fill their classes with the right mix of students to meet all of the needs in terms of who you want to educate and the diversity you want to have and uh, also keeping the lights on. And I can't see an easy way for that to get any different and, and certainly it doesn't seem like it's going to get any easier. All the trend lines are going the wrong way unless someone can fix out, can figure out how to make family income start going up instead of essentially flat or down. Um, I, I'm not sure where that money is going to come from. As we heard when uh, Zakia Smith was talking at lunch yesterday, uh, the federal government doesn't really seem poised to invest a lot of money in private higher education anytime soon either. Right? There's this whole conversation about free college, and even if that goes nowhere, as many people kind of expect it will uh, from a policy standpoint, it's now this normalized talking point that some version of higher education could be free, which makes it a little bit harder to convince families that a sticker price of 20 or 40 or $60,000 makes sense, right, to, to the extent that they already were sort of with you on that. Um, and I think one, one challenge is that it's easy to conflate the uh, perceptions of affordability with the actual problems of affordability. And um, I, I'm personally starting to think Colleges could do a little bit more to talk about this with their own uh, student populations in some different ways. There was a, a recent example, um, I, I think, so part of this is that college affordability is now a problem for basically most American families. I mean, Hillary Clinton's now talking about a free college, uh, free public tuition program that she, she's saying would eventually cover 80% of American families. I mean, we're talking about affordability is a problem for people pretty far up the income spectrum, but it's not the same problem for all those families, right? It's a different problem for people who are making six figures and are stretched and believe they're middle class and their money's not going as far as it used to and they haven't been getting raises. It's a different problem for people who actually are low income. Um, and I think part of the problem is that uh, many, many families, many um, relatively affluent families I talked to believe that low-income people are going to college for free and that they're completely taken care of. I've talked to faculty at colleges that are gapping uh, students with a zero expected family contribution who are really worried about the uh, uh, children, people like them, who are struggling to come up with, you know, twenty or thirty thousand dollars from their two hundred thousand dollar family income. And like not that, that isn't a problem, but they're they're different problems and I think um, Colleges, because they don't really talk about who gets support from where and how and why, um, and it's sort of a black box to families, I think this causes some real complications. There was an example recently, um, a few parents at Duke, not a liberal arts college, but you know, elite university, um, started a change.org petition because tuition was going up 3.8% year over year, which is like a pretty standard tuition increase. I mean, of all the things to protest in terms of <laughs> what's happening with college pricing, like that is their hill to die. I mean, I mean nothing's really going to come of this, probably. I think Duke will keep raising its tuition and probably will be fine filling its class, right? But it, it's just interesting that I, I think there's this level of resentment. And I mean, this is among families who, like if, if that 3.8 tuition increase is affecting you at a place like Duke, you're paying a lot for Duke because you, on paper, can, right? I mean, this um, low-income students there are held harmless, essentially, from something like that. So those aren't the families who are complaining. Um, and I'm just, I'm thinking more and more that um, it's very easy, I think, for people who cherish and defend higher ed to point to the misunderstandings of affordability and sort of have this straw man argument with them and how it's not really that bad. Average debt's like $30,000, it's not 150. Um, many students do fine, on average students do fine. It's like, that's all true, but not all students do fine. I mean, there are people going off to college and borrowing, even if it's not that much, and not graduating and not getting a degree or finishing in sort of a haphazard way and not getting a job, or in some instances, really doing everything right that everyone always told them they should do, and it's still not working out. And I think it's 
it's hard to have both of those conversations at once, but I, I think some of the animosity people have toward higher education institutionally is the sort of lack of recognition of the real challenges families are facing and sort of the different challenges families are facing. I mean, we know our country is getting increasingly bifurcated in a bunch of ways. Students are going off to college, coming from communities where everyone in their high school was, in some cases, very similar to them socioeconomically, if not in other ways. They don't know what it's like for other families on campus. And I know colleges don't really want to get into talking about that, but I'm starting to wonder if maybe that would make a difference for the colleges a little bit to do that. So um, I wrote a story on our website today about yesterday's discussions, and the first comment, which may be from one of you in the room, took me to task. Um, the person didn't post a name and said I was focusing too much on the economic and on demographic challenges, and not the fact that the liberal arts are incredibly important, vibrant, and must survive. Now, to me, the fact that people who would come to this conference believe that sort of is not news. If you didn't. Hear it, <laughs> Here. Um, I'm going to focus here on problems. Now, I definitely agree in, in the next question I will answer. The press does a terrible job of these issues. But I want to talk about some things that you all institutionally are, in fact, responsible for, in specific liberal arts colleges. Um, one, as reflected by that comment, you are not admitting that most of your institutions have an economic model that is um, headed in a seriously wrong direction. If you look at the rise in discount rates, it is not sustainable financially. But also, I would really raise a question, and I asked this yesterday, and um, I'm not sure it's sustainable morally. You are, most of your institutions are in fact giving money to families who don't need it to bribe them to come to your institutions. And you boast about it. You don't use the word bribe that I just did. But you say, we recruited X number of students to turn down the flagship honors college to come here. Think about that for a minute. Think about the fact something we talked about yesterday that is very real. Forget the resentment of the resentment of the middle class and upper class that they, is absolutely real. But what about the resentment of the people who, because they can't afford to spend twenty thousand dollars to send their kid to a liberal arts college, aren't getting offered twenty five thousand dollars to do so? That is very real. Think, if you want to think about how this matters. Look at Hillary Clinton's college plan and then also Bernie Sanders' plan, which influenced hers. It should terrify every one of you that when the Democratic Party changed the way it was looking at college affordability, it paid no attention to private higher education. It assumed that private higher education is not the solution. We need to go to publics. Now, you may fault that, but think about why that is. Think about why, as Akia Smith yesterday was incredibly nice to all of you, because basically private colleges have opposed every initiative of the Obama administration on costs. Maybe, and maybe for good reason, but maybe it shouldn't shock you that the Democrats have come up with solutions to college affordability that don't include you. Um, think about gapping, which Becky alluded to. Is it moral, I, I'm seriously asking, is it moral to tell a student, yes, we admit you, and you can come, but you don't have the money to come here unless you take out a private loan? Do you think about what is the maximum number of, number of dollars that someone should borrow to come here? Um, these are big economic challenges to your institutions. And they're not, for those of you who are not at, say, um, Car it was easy for Carlton's president to be idealistic because he's, he has an endowment way more than uh, probably anyone else. And it's easy to be idealistic if you're Williams or Swarthmore. But these are real things. Other clear things. What is the liberal arts? Now, I think I know. But liberal arts institutions, I think, are incredibly mushy about it. When the Alma trustee yesterday boasted about their new nursing program, I was waiting for somebody in the audience to say, hey, that's good, but is that a liberal arts institution? And I am amazed by the number of liberal arts colleges that their top majors are pharmacy and education. Now, we need pharmacists. We need nurses. There's nothing wrong with educating professionals. But you can't be surprised people mock and don't understand the liberal arts when you don't necessarily have any consistent definition. I don't think there's any shame in saying we are a liberal arts-based professional school. There's nothing wrong with that. 
Um, but when you insist your liberal arts college, when only a minority of your students engage in the liberal arts, you are you make it harder to defend. Some of you at the same time, I think, are excessively pure. And so, and, and I think the solution to a lot of these problems is a little less purity. So, for instance, I wrote recently about Spelman College, a, a liberal arts, historically black women's college, has a new requirement for the English majors. Every English major must produce a trailer, like a movie trailer, for a course in the English department. So the students learn digital skills, promotional marketing and PR skills, and so forth. But they're doing it in the context of English and of literature. Um, I thought that was great. A lot of colleges don't think that way. And then I'd also include a challenge in the liberal arts is wishy-washy defenses of the liberal arts. I am amazed, like this cover, you all should have been protesting at Consumer Reports headquarters for various reasons. <laughs> but, but the number of people who defend the liberal arts by saying, well, we have so-and-so who went on to become an executive and a super rich. I, I do think that people want to know how much they'll need to borrow and whether they'll be able to repay. But it is odd to me that in public debates of the liberal arts, I never hear a college president say, the world is a better place when people who come out of college um, view reading a novel not as a requirement, but as part of their uh, daily existence. The world is a better place when people speak foreign languages and understand other cultures. And I don't mean in the purely pragmatic thing. So just to give you, to give you to again, when I say wishy-washy, Everyone's great at saying, oh, don't cut foreign languages because look at the Middle East. We need people who speak Arabic and, and Farsi and whatever. All true, but is that really your argument? Far more people study French than Arabic. Hmm. While France annoys us with regularity, we're not going to go to war, and the CIA is not going to have a sudden shortage of French speakers. <laughs> so if you believe, and I suspect you do believe, that colleges should teach French. Don't talk about foreign language as a skill only to um, help our national security. And so, and so I think we need, uh, one of the big problems facing the liberal arts, and it relates to the lack of definition, is wishy-washy defenses. Okay, and you, uh, and I, you into that what you want sure. to talk about next, which, which is the next question. How, given these issues that you've been raising, how, are these being portrayed in the media? Sure. So here I want to say that the, the uh, comments I'm going to make that are critical uh, exclude everyone of uh, my, my fellow <laughs> <laughs> So I'm, 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 I'm mainly talking about the national, uh, the, the local Metro Haley's, um, and a lot of the consumer oriented uh, press, but this is hardly unique to consumer reports. One is complete ignorance about what the numbers say. Um, the data show this is not what. when. Constantly, publications are, are, are running articles on, is college worth it? In fact, it's settled. Um, study after study after study. There is no debate that you're better off with a bachelor's degree than an associate degree. You're better off with an associate degree than a high school diploma. You're better off with a master's degree, and so forth. Irrespective of major. Even the studies like that come out of Georgetown that focus heavily on major, the conclusion is always that you're better off with a degree. And yet, the press focuses on the other. The press focuses too much on the extreme. Um, the $132,000 in debt. That's like, to take a Minnesota example, writing about health care by focusing on the Mayo Clinic. Um, the, the, the Mayo Clinic is an important institution. It is totally atypical of health care in America. Um, the average debt, as Becky said, is approaching $30,000. Many people say that's too high, but you actually have to try hard to write, to, to reach $132,000 in debt. And what places should be, what, what publications should be writing about is bad advising. Um, that, that was, there was educational malpractice involved, in my opinion, for somebody to reach $132,000 in debt. Um, Another big thing that we do is we focus far too much on majors and not on general education. Now this extends beyond liberal arts education, but I think one of the defining things about liberal arts education is in fact a strong commitment to general education. 
Um, and that's not only about liberal arts education, but it is defining US education compared to the rest of the world. Many of these articles focus on what would an English major make compared to a, a chemical engineering major, or whatever. Um, there is actually data out there on this that beyond, there be, yes, the engineers will make more than the humanities, we know that. Um, but a lot of the value of a liberal arts college is in the general education, not just the major. The general education is totally absent in most public discussion of the liberal arts college and of the value of college. It's just not there. Likewise, I think there's a related problem. Some colleges are minimizing gen ed to save money, but liberal arts colleges, more than most, actually have these. Then there's also a third really bad thing that the press does, which it doesn't realize that, um, in fact, the reason people choose different majors is not based on wealth alone. I was an undergraduate history major. This somewhat terrified my parents, particularly when I said I didn't want to go to law school because that was what they were thinking I would be, you know, be good and have money. Um, you know, which in journalism, really stupid video financially. Um, but here's the thing, I didn't major in history because I thought I would make more money than had I majored in electrical engineering. People who are going into liberal arts, non-professional fields, aren't idiots. Um, and the assumption of all these things and some public policy is that if we only put these average in earnings in front, then everyone would drop our history or, um, you know, or anthropology as the governor of Florida wants and become a STEM major. The reality is if you want more STEM majors, you need to reform K-12 education. By the time they're in eighth grade, most uh, American students can't be a STEM major. So the reason they're not going there is that's not why. And so that these assumptions underlie so much coverage, and then, but then I will put it a little bit back on you guys. You guys don't protest. You kiss up. Um, um, seriously, you will do anything to be in certain publications. Um, and, don't, <laughs> and don't push back on these issues. Um, and, and it really surprises me. Um, Peter Thiel, uh, who uh, runs this foundation where he paid, gives fellowships to students to drop out of college. Now, one, we reported on this, and actually some of those dropouts actually finished their degree, so it's not quite what he says it is. This year, as in past years, liberal arts colleges give him honorary degrees. <laughs> and I'm just amazed. <laughs> All right, um, so I, I would agree with Scott that there's a lot of um, not so great coverage of higher education. And I want to talk a little bit about why I think that's happening. Um, I think it's really easy, and I try to avoid you know, being at the Chronicle of Higher Education and um, talking about other places that don't cover higher education well enough. Like Scott and I both work in newsrooms where this is kind of all we do. Everyone's specialized within higher education. We've all been thinking about it for years. And, um, and on top of that, I mean, so, so obviously most reporters are not in that position, right? Um, and furthermore, I mean, as you are all probably aware, um, another industry going through a lot of turmoil right now is ours. And that's having some big implications. And um, I have lots of friends who are reporters who are writing multiple stories a day on lots of topics they don't know much about when the day begins. And I try to you know, remind myself what um, my colleagues in some other jobs are up against. I'm very fortunate not to be in that position and to have the time to be able to really think about what I'm saying and why I understand it and, um, you know, be at a, be a publication where, you know, my editors also are, are very familiar with all these topics. Good higher ed reporters at a lot of newspapers have editors who don't think about this stuff very often, even if they're very good at their jobs. So I want to say that first, and I, I think, you know, also to Scott's point about how colleges can approach this differently. Um, I know lots of people who really go out of their way not to talk to their student paper, and I always find that kind of fascinating. Like, where do you think the journalists you're complaining about now are like coming from, right? I mean, why don't you want to talk to them when they're 20 and they go to your college and they're learning still, and uh, they're also in your classrooms? Like, why wouldn't you give an interview to that 
student reporter, if it goes badly, like, there are ways you can address that, right? The student paper also has an editor who you can call if something goes wrong. And, you know, there's someone in a classroom and, like, I read a lot of student papers, but you know what? I mean, most of them aren't that widely read. It's not like the whole world is going to probably see this part. Like, the stakes are actually kind of low for everyone. Like, student papers are real papers, but they're also sort of educational labs. And I, I would just encourage you to, like, think about your relationship with student journalists. Um, because that's an opportunity to help people understand things about the world that they haven't learned yet, right? And, and part of why people like us go into reporting is we like to keep learning things. I mean, that's the typical mindset of a journalist. So I would run with that. Um, additionally, I mean, so our publications are obviously read by people who work at colleges and universities who care about the minutiae of how those places are run and have a very bit of familiarity with it. Already, although sometimes not as much as I would expect, like some of the words I'm, um, you know, that I have to define every time I use them, like tuition, discount, or net price. I'm like, really? I mean, it's 2016, and there, there are people who work at a college who have thought about these words. Like, okay, but uh, I think that's probably still true. Um, most places writing about college are writing for consumers, right? And some of that is, you know, okay, consumer reports is supposed to be this practical, advicey kind of thing, um, but. Most people who are interested in what's happening at colleges and universities aren't, you know, the parents of a 17-year-old on the cusp of going, per se, right? They're people with younger kids or the people who are recent grads. Like, people are interested in college students as just sort of this entity in our social fabric as a society, right? And, and which students are they interested in? Usually the elite students. I mean, it's kind of like you go to the real estate section in the paper and it's like the most expensive houses in town are the ones that get the big write-up, right? It's not like the median house is featured in the real estate section. It's the $2 million house that everyone wants to look at the pictures of, right? I mean, I think it's the same phenomenon that drives this interest in elite colleges. And we at the Chronicle get flack sometimes for over-covering a small slice of colleges and universities. But which articles do you think everyone reads and talks about, including all the people working at not those colleges? <laughs> those articles, right? We know this. We have the data. And so there's some, there's some tension, um, I think, around that. And, and again, I mean, I think the stuff with the anecdotes and the outliers um, and some of the false assumptions kind of makes me crazy. Um, but it also, that perception is based in, in something, right? I mean, it's, it's not coming out of nowhere. I think there is a lot of fear uh, that people have about how their children are going to bear it. We have this whole notion as a society that people uh, outperform their parents in life, and there's some real reason to be skeptical of that for some families right now, and that hits people kind of where it hurts the most, right? Their pocketbook and their heart and thinking about the future of their children, and you know, that, that stuff's not to be taken lightly. And um, I think some of it too, right? So, so colleges have in many cases kind of seeded this argument that ROI is the name of the game. I don't know of many colleges that don't make that argument, I understand why you're under enormous pressure to do so, but now that everyone's sort of agreed those are the terms of the conversation, like, those are now the terms of the conversation, and I think a lot of colleges kind of hide behind the fact that graduates do well on average and resist sharing a lot of information on how their own graduates do compared to that average, right? I mean, I, I've been sort of mulling over lately how higher ed has this um, strong tendency to evaluate itself by looking at its neighbors, and that's not the same as having like some sort of objective goal that the world can see. I think it's a, a, a good example. So um, Washington St. Louis, right, for years and years has been um, bashed and more and more publicly as the New York Times started paying a lot of attention to this for having a uh, smaller share of its students low income than all the other rich elite colleges. We got terrible press, they've worked hard to bring it up to like more the low level of the average. Um, why they for that, right? It's because once you're sort of where the rest of the herd is, you're sort of safe from criticism and I don't know how, it's hard to get really excited about that, right? Like um, to say like, oh, it, it's easy to say college graduates do better than non-graduates in general. Like, yeah, that's absolutely true. But like, why? Why does what's the what's the case for your own particular college? And I think a lot of colleges haven't spent a ton of time investigating that. At least not everyone there has. And I think I mean that is where the conversation is headed. Like, why you 
specifically, what do you have to offer? I mean, I hear these arguments like, oh, private colleges, students graduate on time, you know, that saves them a year of tuition compared to going to the public. Like, okay, which public? Like, and which students? Um, that, that's true in some cases, and I, I think there's an argument to be made there when the publics are overcrowded. I mean, colleges competing with California publics probably had you know, an easy time with that argument. But it's, it's not universally true, right? There are plenty of students who do graduate from publics on time, and those are the students you're probably recruiting. So I just, I, I think there's some, um, like one antidote to sort of the bad um, outlier example thing is better information, and I think for institutions that are all about education and knowledge, there's some real aversion to sharing some of the information that the colleges actually have and don't want the public to know, and in some cases don't even really look at themselves. And I, I kind of wonder about that sometimes. Like, I'm often surprised when a college will share um, good data with me because a, a lot of them say no. And um, as reporters, like, we're a lot more curious when you don't want to tell us stuff. And <laughs> saying this time with my co-college trustee hat on. We, uh, we have had for a number of years in our mission statement a wonderful sentence, we will judge our success by the success of our graduates. I said, well, I love that. Uh, that's something that as a parent and as a, uh, a, a member of the community, I, I really like to have a college affirm. Tell me then, how are you measuring the success of your graduates? And they go, oh, the, the, the. <laughs> uh, not very well. Uh, and often with uh, the kind of measures that come uh, associated with uh, what happens in the first year after graduation rather than the, the next five, 10, 20 years, which I think are the real relevant measures. Now, I, speaking about uh, what goes on in, in newsrooms with, with regard to higher education, and I work for uh, the, the biggest newspaper in the state of Minnesota, so we're, we're uh, you know, unique in some respects, uh, but uh, uh, much like I think what happens in other big newspapers in the country. In the newsroom, we have a higher education beat reporter. And that beat reporter is mostly looking at the public systems. And that's not because of some bias against private systems, but it's the public systems that have got the, the biggest tax dollars at stake. And newsrooms are geared to looking at what happens, happens to tax dollars. And with those big public institutions, you often have the great distraction of sports. <laughs> and the, uh, the fixation on sports in our, in our culture is too great. In our newsrooms, it's too great. It does drive readership and, and viewership online, and so it's going to be something that's hard to change. But that, that kind of narrative it drives uh, a lot of perceptions about higher education. If you ask a, a University of Minnesota president why he uh, puts up with some of the shenanigans that goes on in, within his athletic department, he says, well, this is the window onto the campus. This is the entree that we have to connect with our community, sometimes for good and sometimes for ill. But that, that is uh, too often, I think, the lens with which the newsrooms will come to higher education. They're looking at the spending of tax dollars. They're looking at sports because of a fixation that we all seem to have about sports. So the arguments about, say, the value of general education, which I really resonate with, seldom find their way into a news story. Where is the news peg in, in something like that? The generation of more statistics, I think, about the value of, 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 of uh, what, what graduates experience in years past year one would be helpful in that regard. But uh, the other thing that I think would be helpful is better branding of what Bill of means, and, and Scott, you spoke to that too. We have a lot of schools, and my little college and I was one of them, that are really kind of hybrid liberal arts and professional education. That's not a bad thing. That's actually maybe something to celebrate. If we believe that the liberal arts have great value in, in the, the preparation of people for leadership roles in our society, don't we want professional education to be rather deeply infused with the liberal arts? And then don't we want to be able to point with some specificity to the competency that generates in terms of cultural connections, in terms of ability to work in teams, in terms of critical thinking. Those kinds of evaluative things, which we just saw in the, the program before this one, but that uh, Rick Meyer called to our attention from the IBM survey. That, uh, that uh, is, is certainly something that, as we think about how we sell the liberal arts, both individually as individual institutions and as a group like this one going forward, uh, finding ways to repackage, redefine, and then quantify those contributions, I think is pretty important to selling these sorts of things to, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, to the, the general public through the mass media. Okay, uh, right in the front row. Time for questions? You'll go, go ahead. <laughs> You'll make it time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> if you tell us where you're from. Uh. I'm from a, a 
Uh, anyhow, I'm a trustee of the College of St. Benny. Okay. Uh, I, I want to go back to your first set of remarks. Um, got so excited, where to start? But I'd like to just do, make two quick points. I think I heard you say that you never heard a president of Liberal Arts College say, Liberal Arts make the world a better place. And I'd like to call to your attention the fact sheet distributed. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and Michael Nemeseth, president of St. John's University, <laughs> Let us remember that the liberal arts and sciences together have improved the lives of humanity materially and spiritually over the centuries while also making our hearts sing. The sword covers the inside and the outside. The second point I want to make is you have not persuaded me instead of living happily for another 15 years, I have to die if within the next year and leave my paltry savings to my grandchildren because they have ordinary family incomes all my sons were liberal arts college graduates. But from what I understood you to say, the ordinary families don't need help. It's only other people who need help. No, no, no. So no, if no, I die, no, 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 I want no. this uh, effort to show up. Okay, so, so on the first point on presidents, yes, obviously, I, 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 I was making a point. But I have, look, I have, and I'm sure, again, I have an average of one president a day that is in my office to tell us tell me and my colleagues how wonderful their institutions are. And they aren't all liberal arts college presidents, but many of them are. They don't, in fact, put forward the kinds of things that you're talking about. They put forward other things. They're very proud of their institutions. And when they have national platforms, I generally don't hear them put that forward. I think they're much more likely to say, our graduates get into medical school and law school than this other stuff. Again, it's different when they're preaching, you know, here they're preaching to a choir. Now, it is absolutely the case that many middle-income families who are not rich cannot afford to attend most private colleges because they require little, uh, they are eligible for literal, little federal and state aid. And so the argument in favor of non-need-based aid is we need to help these people. And I don't, I don't suggest that, they, that it's easy or even doable for many families to do this. But what I'm saying is the decision-making process on non-need-based aid is not who needs the aid the most, including middle class. It is who can we motivate to come here. The whole system, it, it, because that's the thing. It's not, when people, I try not to use the term merit. If you want to talk merit aid, the Rhodes Scholarships are merit aid. Most of what is called merit aid is colleges determining in this zip code there are reasonably wealthy people. We know that we're not, we don't have the reputation of Williams and Amherst or Harvard. So we're going to get them, and so these parents aren't going to pay full freight to come to us. They're going to send their kid to the flagship state university unless he or she gets into super elite college, so we're going to pay them. Now, is there a broader problem with financing higher education? Absolutely. All I'm saying is that the current approach of using aid money to attract more wealthy people is strikes me as uh, questionable, in part because it means you're not making the sale. Because if in fact, because the, the many times they're competing, they used to, used to be that one of the things I like to ask college presidents is who are your top overlap colleges, meaning the colleges that they get the most cross apps of. It used to be a private college and liberal arts colleges, their cross apps were always other private colleges and liberal arts colleges. So they had made the sale to the student to seek that kind of education. Now, increasingly, it's the state flagship. And that's who they're competing with, which is why they're throwing big dollars, because the state flagship has a financial edge. But what's the alternative? Um, For middle class, middle income families who want to educate their children in a liberal arts tradition rather than in a huge state. So, so there, there are, for instance, um, a number of public systems have created liberal arts um, units of the state system. Uh, St. Mary's College of Maryland um, is a liberal arts college, but it's part of the state system. Truman State in Missouri. Um, the honors colleges at public universities. Um, I don't mean to suggest that there's not great, and, and, and again, maybe you all can in fact finance more people. 
But it's not being awarded based on me. It's being awarded based on who you can lure. And that is, um, and, and the stakes are going up. Wealthier families are, are asking for more and more money to enroll. And so this is not going to work financially. It's going to fill your class this year and next year. But this is, look at the rise in the discount rate. Um, and I don't know what St. Ben's discount rate is, and some colleges are keeping it under control. But, um, but general, the national average there is that discount rates are going up and up. I met with a president two weeks ago who has a 72% discount rate. And that would have been unheard of. There are, but he's not alone. But, but I want to push back on one more point. And yeah. stop. If you do what you're suggesting, so these middle class families who go to the flagship state institution, College of Liberal Arts, the LA, the University of Minnesota, the schools will lose the piece that those families can pay. So yeah. then what? Because that um, means a huge drop then in income for the schools themselves. So well, let, let me give you an example aside from financial aid. So a number of liberal arts colleges have in recent years added football. This always amazes me because most university presidents with football, if you gave them a truth serum, would say, I wish I didn't have it. <laughs> They're doing it to get men. Likewise, a big trend among Midwestern liberal arts colleges is to start lacrosse. Why, Why lacrosse? Because lacrosse historically has been um, most popular uh, in the uh, Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states. Um, and, so, and so there are a lot more high school kids playing lacrosse and who love lacrosse who can ever aspire to play lacrosse at Johns Hopkins or Duke or places that are not for lacrosse. So it seems like a very smart thing. Now it's also smart because poor kids actually don't play lacrosse. Right. Um, so, so, so you can look at this and we looked at Beloit College. I don't know if you have any from Beloit, but Beloit has done this very successfully. Um, and that's great. But is a liberal arts college defending itself and making a sustainable future if it's getting students to come because they can play lacrosse? And, and I would say, ultimately, um, the liberal arts college will be stronger if people are coming to a liberal arts college because they believe in the liberal arts college. And what you see now is you see a lot of arguments that have nothing to do with being a liberal arts college. Now, all these strategies will work in the short term. But what happens when, I don't know if the University of Minnesota has a bit of news for Wisconsin plays lacrosse and they do it bigger and better because they're big time sports programs. Um, and, they can, and what happens when federal, pol if federal policy changes to make public higher education, if not free, uh, closer to free? These are all big threats and I think most, a lot of the strategies that you're talking about are well intentioned and are helping people, but they think they are band -aid. Yeah. Just a, a, a oh, thing, yeah. really just two comments on right? that question. I'm sorry. No, please. Uh, first of all, I'm so happy to hear you say K through 12 reform. I haven't heard it uh, these, these few days, and I think you know if we look at education, not only the problems with the kinds of deficiencies and skills that lead to challenges for us in developmental programs, but a, a, a system that still runs in such an antithetical way to liberal arts education. We're all, we've all had experiences of students sitting in our classes. I'm, I'm lucky I taught philosophy because, you know, you can hope them. There's very interesting material. But this apathy and indifference towards learning, someone mentioned anti-intellectualism yesterday. I think that needs reform. So it's not just the, 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 the content or the skills, of, but the, the, the philosophy. And it's interesting, this is the 100 year anniversary of John Dewey's Democracy and Education. Missed if I didn't mention that, but so you know it's 100 years since you published that, and still we, we don't see many of those simple solutions to, to changes. And, and so the attitude and philosophy that we see in K through 12, and so and, and there's a gap there too, right? So I, 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 we don't have enough bridges, so they get to us. You know, they, we give them a syllabus; they've never had a syllabus before. But even the most basic thing, they, they don't understand. And so we need greater communication. Uh, among the, the, the two different uh, areas of, of education, if you will, but a transformation in the attitude. So maybe liberal arts, some of the things we need to do is, is talk to uh, secondary uh, schools or even primary schools to kind of establish that, that attitude towards you know, free thinking and all these wonderful things we want them to do. We ask them to think for themselves and they look at you, no one's ever asked me to do that. 
Gloria. Well, I was going to say, I think that's a wonderful point and, and one that we should all think, spend some time on, on our governing boards thinking about. The interface between private colleges and uh, K-12 education is something that we've been, I think, neglectful of at times. One of the most exciting things that's happening in the education realm in the state of Minnesota is uh, dual credit approaches. It used to be just for uh, uh, kids who, uh, uh, high school students who had uh, very close access to often a public campus and, and had, were intellectually gifted kids. Increasingly, it's for everybody, and especially for the, the young people who maybe aren't considered you know, the raw Scott material. Uh, some connections are being built in lots of high schools between uh, high schools and community colleges. Uh, so that young people can graduate from high school with very close to having an associate of arts degree and an easy entree to the workforce. I think that's great. It gets a lot of po positive attention. It's solving the problem on a bunch of levels for these, for these people and, and for communities. Uh, certainly solving a workforce shortage problem. The liberal arts colleges in Minnesota have been largely not part of that scene. And it's a, I think it's unfortunate. There, there are, there's an opportunity for interaction toward dual credit kind of approaches, it seems to me, with private colleges that just are, are largely unexplored. Uh, uh, I think that uh, they they're talk about places where there's a, a new market to look at, that might be one of them. Well, and if you look at, um, actually today, the Obama administration is sending a letter out to K-12 districts saying that sort of realize that no child left behind has been interpreted to mean don't worry about the humanities and arts. And we didn't mean it. And, 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 um, and they are you know, asserting in a very positive way that I suspect would win the favor of everyone here that this stuff matters. But, but I would ask the question a long way, is that, you know, how many liberal arts college leaders have gotten involved in those discussions? And K-12 districts, through no fault of their own, because they're under incredible pressure, and as they've thought about how to meet various state accountability measure, measures, they've focused very heavily on testing, and they perceive that they get a lot more credit for STEM than producing people who uh, want to engage in those kinds of discussions. Have you all been involved in that? I'd also say another policy issue in which I don't have a lot of private colleges involved is the attacks on liberal arts at public higher education. Uh, if you want to look at where um, liberal arts has most been eroded, and this I realize undercuts my example to you, um, um, it's been at non-flagship publics. If you look at regional public universities, um, we did a big thing on University of Wisconsin Eau Claire as an example. That is where a lot of people have gotten great liberal arts education, and also where a lot of people like, you know, who had become the Main Street business person or whatever had certain kinds of experiences. That's been totally eroded. Now, some of the I've talked to some of the arts people who actually view it as, as good for their institutions, that people who want to major in a liberal arts field may feel that only an option is a liberal arts college, but I actually feel it undercuts the liberal arts colleges because it is in many uh, state systems, the idea of becoming an English major, let alone a philosophy major, is becoming unheard of. And I think when that happens, it hurts liberal arts colleges. And, and yet, again, in these battles that have been going on in state after state, look at the departments getting eliminated at your regional public universities and their liberal arts departments. And that can tend to lead on the humanities side. Yeah. Yeah, you. I'm Cheryl Ellison from Shawmon University of Honolulu, um, a very small um, private liberal arts college, um, close to a flagship at the University of Hawaii, and so all of the, the popular press in the area is all about the University of Hawaii. Um, so I, I certainly appreciate many of the things you've said about the attention. I guess my question is, I really appreciated also what you've said about um, the universities actually taking the lead as a proactive position and telling the public what we actually do, the kinds of great things our students do. Our students are in the community, you know, working for nonprofits, our students are teachers, our students do all these <coughs> things, right, and, and uh, do make the world a better place and go into politics and all of these very good things. But I think that, that many times the universities are reacting out of a sense of, kind of a reactive thing to the press. And I guess um, that's my question, is how can we sort of help be part of that narrative that like, we don't have to just talk about the one guy who's a CEO somewhere who makes $50 billion. Instead, we have hundreds of people every year literally making Hawaii and the rest of the world, I would argue, a much better place because they care about other human beings, they care about communicating with them, they care about being in a diverse 
um, world. We're a Native Hawaiian serving institution. We have a huge uh, Pacific Islander population. So we have a genuinely diverse um, campus. And that's one of these strengths. But what most of our students are first generation, and the press they see is not as nuanced as Inside Higher Ed Chronicle. But you know, I read that, my colleagues read it. But if I send those articles to my students and they give it to their parents, they're like, yeah, that's for you guys. That's to make you feel better about your school. What they see is Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Consumer Reports, is this a waste of money? Is you won't get a job? I'm just gonna make this much money. So how can we um, address that, that they're very much, right, that these parents do care deeply about their kids and the only version of the academy or education they're seeing is this is a waste of money. There are cheaper, faster ways to do it. Um, and they're not reading, you know, again, they're not reading the Chronicle and, and the, the um, things that are more targeted for an academic audience. Um, so how do we respond to that without just being reactive, I guess is my question, because I think it's so true that we are doing all these good things that are very mushily defined. <laughs> you know, and I'm an English professor, I want everything defined very well. I do think about the rhetoric of these things. But how can we do that as a small institution that's up against this kind of national, international, right, publicity about the ways universities are, you know, I think you call it educational malpractice, like taking your money for this degree that you're not geared in of working as a barista at Starbucks. Um, which is so untrue, actually, right? The data doesn't bear that out. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So, so a few things. So, one um, uh, place you might want to look at is Wake Forest, which is not a liberal arts college, but it has a lot of professional schools, but it has a liberal arts core. They've done something very smart, I think. Every major at Wake Forest, you can go to their major page, and there is data, not not data, but line by line examples. What did last year's and the previous year's class do? Now, it's not by name for privacy reasons, but you call it up and so you get like history and you will see law school, um, becoming a public school teacher, working for a nonprofit, whatever. Um, they put it all out there. And, and I think Becky's point earlier that a lot of colleges hide this stuff is very on point. But they put it all out there. And one, it shows that they're employed. Two, it shows in the liberal arts fields that many of them are in the helping professions and they're actually making the world a better place. But also it gets away from this very false sense that um, you, if you're a history major, you're becoming a historian, um, which is part of the false narrative that you need to challenge. And it challenges it by also getting away from averages. It's not saying what average job is. It's saying, boom, 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 here are all the jobs. And I think it's very effective. Two, you need to write pieces, much as I love it when you write pieces for Inside Higher Ed, you need to be writing pieces for the Honolulu paper and whoever. We just ran a piece of that type by, the, by an English professor at George Mason University, and it was called um, The Myth of the English Major Barista. And it could have run, and, it should, and I hope it will run subsequently in other places. You need to write these pieces and to be out there, not just in Inside Higher Ed and the Chronicle, but in your local papers with that. And what this piece did, it went through and it showed how English majors aren't more likely to be unemployed, aren't more likely, and, 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 and even to the data on, because you can get Labor Department data on food service, in fact, English majors aren't dominating the barista industry. Oh. <laughs> 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 and then another thing you should do, so one, you should also um, start sharing information that, uh, that I share, that Becky shares. So I wrote, I wrote a story about an amazing study that I can't believe wasn't discussed in this program that every one of you should be studying. And if you're not getting my news, give me your card after and I'll give it to you. And, and come get the Inside Heart Poetry Magnet too after. But this study was done by the Great Lakes College Association, so we're even in the right region. And I bet many of you are members. But it wasn't just the Great Lakes Colleges. They did a national look at college graduates um, 10, 20, and 40 years out. It didn't focus specifically on the large colleges, but what they looked at was income, but they also looked at are you a leader in community? And this amazing question when you think about are you happy? Um, and are you happy with your life? They, they didn't code it by liberal arts college, but then they asked them a series of questions about characteristics of their education, which very much overlaps with liberal arts. So they, so they said, did you have close personal relationships with faculty members? Did you interact with students and faculty members inside class about big issues in life as opposed to just the curriculum? Did you have faculty members with whom you interacted outside? 
of the classroom, and then very going back to gen ed, the, the undercovered issue, did you take a lot of courses outside of your major? Now, all of these things might actually be true as well of Caltech, not just liberal arts colleges, but they are generally true of liberal arts colleges. There is demonstrable evidence that they have found that people with those characteristics are leaders in the field, are earning more on average, and are happier. This is like an amazing thing. Um, we covered it, got no other coverage. It amazes me because what people want is for me to write another story that says, um, English majors are really baristas, but they're not. <laughs> so we're not going to write that story. But the thing is, you guys need to be attuned to when there is research that actually shows it, and then you need to call the Honolulu newspaper and get them to write it. And then, going back to your question, then maybe more people would want to go to liberal arts colleges and they wouldn't have to be bribing them. I mean, <laughs> it, really, it really does all the way. Uh, if you, may I just add to that? If, if your college relations office is primarily playing defense, rather than offense with the local news organizations, that, that organization is not serving you well. You need to have people in those shops who know, who think like journalists, and know how to suggest stories and place stories and, and place commentary pieces. This is a game of, of offense and well defense. And offense, I think, should be the, the principal activity for those offices. Okay, so I have a related question. Thank you for calling on me. Um, this has been an awesome panel. Thank you so much. Um, you're, pe you're preaching to the choir, I think. Uh, a little bit to like a choir that's enthusiastic and wants to learn, but is a little bit unprepared. So I have a comment and a question. And I've just been reflecting on my own. Um, I teach art history at St. Catherine University in St. Paul, Minnesota, in the College for Women and the School of Humanities, Arts, and Sciences. And you know, I went through grad school, did all the you know work for my dissertation. Never once was there, never once was there a conversation about how to talk to folks outside of my sphere about what I do and what I care about and what I teach, right? So um, I'm thinking about how that relates to our un or my unpreparedness for entering into this conversation. I want to learn. So my question is, are there um, are there like worksheets on how to um, write an op-ed piece? Um, how to tweet effectively. I mean, I only have 187 followers. That's not a huge audience, <laughs> but I'm trying. I'm trying to get into that conversation. How do you get into the conversation streams to change it? Um, I'll, I'll keep going. So I, that's a great question, and I think um, many professors and probably most students don't feel equipped to talk about the connection between their education and what they're doing and other things, and part of that is it's kind of complicated, and part of that is no one really talks about it. I think with social media in particular, there are people who are doing it really well, and one nice thing about Twitter is it makes it easy to approach people that might be kind of harder to approach in real life because of sort of, you know, how they connect to you being maybe sort of tenuous or they're kind of up here in some way. But I would look for some people you think, you know, faculty members or other examples of public intellectuals you think are doing a good job of making that case and seem to have a following, and just reach out to them and ask for advice. I think they'd probably be receptive to that and eager for more people to be participating. So that, that's where I would... Do you have a name start to your mind? Um, I, I'm not sure particularly, but uh, there are a lot of yeah. higher ed folks active on Twitter. I would just look around for someone you feel kind of resonates okay. with how you'd want to go about it and, and try that person and just send them a direct message and ask if you can pick their brain. I mean, the worst thing they can do is they know, right? Yeah. Two, two quick things. So we were at Emory University has a new requirement for PhDs. In addition to filing their dissertation, they must do a one-page summary of the dissertation uh, to be read by a non-academic. Um, that's really smart um, because it says that you don't just need to be a genius, you need to be able to communicate. Um, similarly, we run something every day called the Academic Minute. It was founded by Mount Holyoke College and uh, a bunch of NPR stations since moved to AACNU, and we collaborate on it. Every day we run, uh, it's actually not a minute, it's actually 90 seconds, um, a professor talking about his or her research, but for a non-specialized audience. Um, we, people have been turned down who have like won major prizes but just can't get with the program. <laughs> but, but, but this is something that has to be valued by academe, not instead of doing your research, but can you talk for 90 seconds for a non, can you do it about something in art history that would be interesting, but not for an art historian? And, and this stuff, and likewise, another question I ask and we heard about some is, um, how many of you like speak at the Rotary Club? 
speak to groups of non-academics. Now, generally the, the reward structure in higher ed will give you no credit for it, which I blame all the presidents and deans for. But, but the reality is there are people who are out there and who are engaged in public life, and a lot of academics look down on them. And because they don't um, have that level of expertise. And, and you have to, I'll give you my favorite example of this, I did a story once in which I was quoting a philosopher, and, and he said to me, do you know who Nietzsche was? I said, yes. And so he's giving to me, have you read him in the original? <laughs> and, <laughs> and so he's basically telling me, I think you are an ignorant. <laughs> To, you know, it's fine for you to be intellectually elite with your peers, right. but how do you communicate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, um, thank you so much for the panel. I, I, I hope uh, my colleague is wonderful. Um, we've heard your apologetic for coming up with arguments in defense of the liberal arts that are not tied to our office. That saves the device. Uh, we heard yesterday about transformation as a large category of the liberal arts. My question has to do with uh, taking on seriously this, this claim that we should honor our own distinctives. Uh, what about the component of faith? We're at a Catholic university, many of us are faith-based institutions. Uh, do you find that presidents, faculty, etc., are somewhat nervous when they're speaking to uh, large uh, mainline journalists about their faith and the distinctive components or, or benefit of their faith commitments? Or what would be better ways of integrating that into their identity and public posture? Um, I have found it varies by faith. So Catholic colleges like this one um, ha have lots of non-Catholic students and faculty members. So while they are proud of their faith, they don't worry about the fact that not everyone shares the faith in the same way. Um, uh, the Catholic experts here may uh, correct me. Um, it gets more complicated at um, statement of faith institutions, where by uh, requirement, all, all faculty, and sometimes all faculty and students, must agree to a bit. And, and in those institutions, do we have anyone from a CCCU institution here? So um, I have, I've had the experience of speaking at CCCU audiences as the Council of Christian Colleges and Universities, um, I'm Jewish, so I would not be able to sign the statement of faith of any of those. And I find some CCU institutions very much want to engage in the broader higher education world and are very proud and want to be part of it and are responsive. And there are others that, in my experience, sort of figure I'm secular heathen and why bother? And, and, and that's obviously a choice that CC, that an individual college can make. So I think some of them are more comfortable than others. Um, I think almost by definition at faith-based institutions, even those with professional programs, are training people to do more than, um, uh, than just learn a skill. And, and we wrote about, I'm trying to forget, I think it was a Catholic college we wrote about some years ago that was being criticized by uh, traditional Catholics for not being Catholic enough. And they did a survey in which they showed that their graduates were more likely 10 years out to be going to mass <laughs> that were Catholics who didn't go to, a cap to their college. And it was very interesting because a lot of the, the critics will say, oh, well, I went to Sunday Mass and there was no one there, so you must be all hedonists or whatever. But, but they were making the case that it takes, but it takes a while for it to be seen. Um, but it was interesting to me that they were actually doing research on and sharing that as a point of pride. So certainly some do, um, but others I think are nervous about uh, the secular press. I'd like to, as part of the secular press, let me say that I, I, I really, as a writer myself, am open to arguments from uh, religious schools about the value of those schools to the community, very much so. And, and, and so um, I had a self to tell the story of how it uh, came to me that I uh, came to, my task was to write the editorial calling for Archbishop Neinstead's resignation mm -hmm. some time ago. And one of the reasons we did that was because of our concern for the impact of his continued leadership on St. Thomas 
say, Catholics and Catholic, Catholic schools in our area. Uh, we, we were able to articulate the value of those institutions for a positive brand for faith and faith having value for the larger community. And, and, and so people are open to those arguments and, and should, I think folks in colleges of uh, uh, faith based should not shy away from it. My daughter's getting married in April, and being a good academic, I looked up the price of an average wedding <laughs> and found that the answer was approximately $30,000. And I thought, wait a second, I've heard that number <laughs> And so I started looking for the articles expressing outrage over the $30,000. And if you go to the same newsstand where you've got yours, you'll find six magazines encouraging you to spend more. <laughs> Last weekend, you could do it for less. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a responsibility for the media to contextualize and to lead the culture and not just trail the culture? Well, consumer contextualize our information and put thirty thousand dollars into the thing. Why is a family willing to go into hop thirty thousand dollars for an afternoon, but not for four years of an education? I've got a couple thoughts on that one. Um, so the, first of all, the survey data on the cost of weddings is from like bridal magazines, which gets to like a demographic of people who are having weddings and not, not the full population. Like if you're going to a courthouse wedding, you're probably not reading those things. Also, I mean, if you look at who is getting married now, it's not everyone, right? It's wealthier people who are still having weddings and even getting married typically. Like there's a population split. Um, so as a society, we've decided marriage is not necessary, but we're telling everyone that higher education is, right? And so I think that makes a, a bit of a difference. Like the president's not telling school kids that they all have to get married if they want to have a middle-class lifestyle, um, although in some cases it helps. But <laughs> it's a different category of thing. I mean, I think part of the challenge for higher ed, right, is it's, um, it's a consumption good, but it's something else too, and it's the something else too that makes it this social issue we're debating, right? And, and I think, um, you know, the, there are the conversations about your climbing wall or your lazy river or whatever, but I think most, most people out there recognize like what we're really talking about when we're talking about what college costs and how people pay for it is the immense expense of education itself and the human beings that it takes to provide that and the fact that they need to support their families too. And, um, you know, I, I think the degree to which some of these things are necessary is a little bit, is a little bit different. Um, I mean, I, I definitely have talked to some families who have like dipped into their retirement to pay for weddings. I think that's um, probably not the greatest uh, life plan, but, if you look at sort of the difference between, you know, a cheap wedding and an expensive wedding and a cheap education and expensive education, I think the education's a little narrower, honestly. Like, you, you can't get an education right now, usually for free, and you can get married for almost that. Uh, and the, there's a, also a, a context issue that I think actually the press does a terrible job of with regard to colleges. Um, we, and we're, and I've, I've been guilty of this, when a college makes tough decisions, that people are protesting. We love that story. So I was thinking about yesterday the example of Nordic skiing here. Um, you know, it, I, I bet there were stories about how this was an assault on the Nordic heritage of Minnesota <laughs> and whatever. And then, you know, or, or, or last year the University of Alabama at Birmingham uh, said it was going to kill its football team. And if you look at the local press coverage, all hell broke loose rather than people writing stories about, like, actually, you know, there's no shortage of football in Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, the press glorifies wealth. If you want to get it, the New York Times or certain other publications, hire a big name architect to build a fancy building. I, I consciously do not do these stories or assign these stories because basically they're institutions spending way more than they need to. There are almost always institutions that, you know, and yet that's described as the norm. The New York Times did a story last summer which infuriated me for weeks. It was the 10 worst dorms in higher ed. But here's the thing, it wasn't the 10 worst dorms in higher ed. It was the 10 worst dorms at elite colleges. So these were institutions that might, you know, they didn't have flat screen TVs. I mean, this was real hardship. But, but so we do miss on context 
We don't write stories on, here's a great educational building that's kind of ugly on the outside, but it's really advancing this college's mission. Um, and so this thing of compare, what gets glorified versus not, and context is, is a big issue. Yeah, Karen. I'm interested, earlier this morning we learned that employers would like us all to do a better job because our graduates aren't where they ought to be and, and we say, well, K-12 really ought to do a better job and, and then, you know, parents really should do a better job. It's sort of this, if we're really on board with lifelong learning and the community sharing the responsibility for lifelong education in a time where people have to be flexible and retraining, retooling, moving from job to job, we really do have to talk to each other more, and the colleges need to talk to K-12 and employers. We need to be leveraging our alumni associations. We need to be doing all that. So I'm um, thank you for all the tips on how to talk better. Because we're at a Benedictine school, I want to ask the question, do we need to listen better too? And how can we set up mechanisms for listening better? What a wonderful idea. <laughs> Absolutely, but I think we have to ask the question, listen to whom? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would like to see us listen to our communities at large more. I, I, I've been, what's been on my mind is I've been listening to the conversation for the last few minutes is, is the, the, the rather, you know, the very important and, and, and somewhat unique role that liberal rights scholars in the United States play for the development of citizenship and democracy. Mm -hmm. Such an important thing that, that we don't talk about enough. I think that is the rightful counterbalance to all the successive consumer talk. <coughs> And uh, how, how are we going to be more engaged in, in building citizenship and building democracy? We're listening to it, to a constituency that is not just our prospective students and their parents, or just our faculties and our, our donors. Listening more broadly is probably what's in order. Well, and actually, I, I want to build on that. The listen to who is actually the key question, I think. Because colleges these days, particularly private colleges that are anxious about students, they do tons and tons of focus groups of high school students who might come, parents of high school students who might come, and so forth. And actually, they're pretty in touch with who they think their potential students are and what they want. They do a lot of listening. They listen to alumni, uh, what will prompt you to give or not. But they're not listening to people who are not involved at all. And this comes up in interesting ways. When President Obama proposed free community college, the thing I heard from tons of people at four-year institutions, and especially private, was like, why? It's not that expensive. This isn't the reform most needed. There are all these middle-class families who need help. What they never listened to was that, unlike most, uh, the significance of that plan was that it wasn't trying to make it easier for those already seeking higher education. The entire emphasis of the free community college plan, and this doesn't make it good, was how do you change the decisions of people not seeking higher education at all? And the reason many in higher ed, four-year institutions, were sort of mystified by that is that's not their agenda item. And so, so it's a so yes to listening, but to whom? I mean, there's too much listening going on to wealthier high school students and their families, and maybe not enough to others. John? I, I just, I want to underscore back a little bit, um, just ask about your sort of fears and concerns, because we're all here, and, well, many of us are here thinking, will you please write about us? And if we all just appeared once in the Star Tribune, or the Chronicle of Higher Education, or Inside Higher Education, or the gold standard, the New York Times, that the entire world would think we are so awesome. Um, but yet, we, and, and I think perhaps part of what you're telling us is that instead of us telling you how can you tell our story better, why don't we tell our story better? Um, but I want to talk about the media. So when I was in high school a thousand years ago, there were four dailies in the Minneapolis State Paul area. Each city had its own uh, morning and evening. And there were about 15 sources where a person could get their news. That was the media. Um, now, the media are thousands of sources, and in fact, every person, the barriers to entry are in fact so low that everybody can be their own media. So we're looking at you saying, how can, how can we tell our story with you? Who's your audience? I mean, because part of it is, what is the media? And so to whom, because I think it's a two-way street, we're, we're struggling with to whom should we talk? 
I'm wondering to you, are there more people actually listening to you now than there were? So or the there rest of the week we're going to have a conference about the media now and, and discuss the issues that in our profession, which are, <laughs> which are abundant. We can, that's a whole different conference now. No, but I just, it's a really curious inter interchange here because we struggle as institutions with who is the media. And I'll just use rankings as the all-time great piece of it. Every college here is on a list. I would suspect every college here is at least on one of those many, many lists in a good place. And so we pick the list that puts us in the best place and say, that's the media. So how do you think about that when we approach you? Um, or are, are we part of your audience? Um, and, and, and I guess part of it, I'm just struggling a little bit here after this conversation is what is the media? Just like with the person, I think Rick or Andy said it in the last session, we say, the faculty. You know, it's like when you've met one faculty member, you've met one faculty member. <laughs> so we might be the same way about the media. Right, that we are at such a point of major change. In my industry, that it, uh, we are the media for the last 20 years. And Politico, Pro, certainly, and they're doing it in different ways. 
Uh, at some of these publications, you can be an activist and a reporter mm -hmm. at many of these publications. And so while I'm proudly new school and being online only, I actually believe in some old school things like um, opinion and news are both important things, but they should be separate and labeled as such. And, and that is increasingly disappearing in some of the new models. And if you look at something like Covington Post, they do some very strong investigative reporting, but also if any of you are desperate for press attention, you can send them just about anything and they'll publish it. And, 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 and some of which may or may not be true. And so the gatekeeper role has changed. And likewise, the, on a lot of these, the drive, and like, I love traffic as much as the next guy. I've got a, um, you know, I've got my dashboard and I'm looking every day at which stories are doing well. But there are things I won't do for traffic. And um, I'm very, we didn't cover Malia Obama's college choice. Um, I told people what we're talking, I said, if she goes to Western Governors University, we'll write about it. <laughs> Most reformers, Barack Obama is sending his daughter to a traditional university. But so, so avoiding certain things that would be clickbait, but also rankings. So I will save you all some time. Do not send me a press release when you go up 10 notches in US news. I won't write about it. When we're writing about whether a president has done well or poorly, I will not include as evidence that the institution went up or down because I think it's just all faulty. But the rankings and the consumer stuff, which is clickbait, it gets a lot of traffic for a lot of my colleagues elsewhere. Um, you have to be willing to do things. So it is a constantly evolving um, journalism world, and you have to think about it. You know, Rick said in his talk earlier, he was talking about liking to read the paper. Um, even so, like, we know we have much more mobile traffic between 5 and 8 a.m. than the rest of the day. So we have to think about the fact, when I talk to presidents, they will frequently say, I wake up with you. So they wake up, they scan their, their mobile device to make sure we haven't written anything terrible about that. <laughs> but then they do the, their real engagement later with a desktop. But so that means you have to think about multiple formats in a way that, that we didn't used to. So yes, very evolving world, which is why we probably a journalist sympathize with uh, you academics. Lori, Becky, Scott, thank you for a lively discussion.